Good morning, church. Um, I do need to clear something up. We are not talking about money today. Uh, so everybody breathe a sigh of relief. Everybody's like, thank God. <laughs> Our visitors are like, man, this church is really focused on money. I mean, two offerings and, and then talking about money. Um, just to kind of explain our practice, we believe in giving every week uh, to the work of the Lord. And then on fifth Sundays, uh, you guys, if you're visiting with us, you are blessed to join us on a fifth Sunday. We are in the process of seeking uh, to break down our building debt because we are a church that is specifically focused on the needs of our community. And we spend $1,400 a month on this building, and we don't want to spend our money on this building. Uh, we want to put it into the bellies of uh, the people that are hungry in our city. Uh, those who are in need. Uh, we want to be invested in this city because we believe that the Lord has called us to serve this city. Uh, with all that said, in two weeks, we are going to start our money series. And so, <laughs> and so uh, we are going to dive into what the Lord calls us to because faithfulness is really about all things. And what I have found personally, that one of the areas that I really struggle with is my checkbook. Because I like to think that my money is my money. And, and what we'll discover in this series is that money talks. Money reveals something about you. The way you use your money reveals something about you. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying, hey, you know what, you, you need to give more. What I'm saying is just consider what your money, how you use your money, what it communicates about you. It'll be a short series and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. I've had a lot of emails of people saying, hey, I'm I just want to know when your series is. And I was telling somebody, I said, you know, I think people are really excited. And they said, either that or they're trying to figure out the days they should go and visit other places. <laughs> um, and so uh, in two weeks, we're going to dive in that series. Today, we're actually going to continue a mini series focused in on building community and making disciples. If you've been around the Alliance Church here lately, you know that we are focused on really two things. We want to be a church that is more focused on building community, Christian community, and trying to figure out what that looks like today. Uh, because what we're discovering is no one really understands that super well. And we want to be a church that's making disciples. And so last week, we focused on making disciples. Today, we're going to focus on community. But before we actually dive into that deep, let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for your grace and your love and the opportunity for us to be here today. Uh, God, it is our prayer uh, that we would just be faithful to you. Uh, Father, that we would have a deep understanding of what you are calling out of us. And Father, what are you calling us to? Uh, Father, that we would be a people of wisdom, and God, that we would just continually uh, be shaped into the image of your Son. Uh, God, we pray over the lesson today. Uh, Father, it's my prayer that you'd be with the speaker, for his sins are many. Uh, Father, may he not get in the way of your perfect message. Father, what is of him, may it be blown away like the chaff. And Father, the things that are from you, may it stick to the hearts of your people. Father, may it convict the unbelievable. And Father, may we all um, take a step today uh, towards your Son. God, as we talk about community, uh, we just pray that uh, you would prick our hearts and help us to understand um, that the gospel calls us into community, as crazy as it might be. Uh, Lord, we love you. We are thankful for this time that we have to open up our Bibles. Uh, Father, may we learn. It's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray in the church set. Amen. So back in 2008... A song was rising up the charts uh, on the country scene. It was a, a song by Billy Currington. Some of you might be familiar with this guy. Billy Currington. I mean, it was just shooting up the charts, making its way higher and higher and higher. And the chorus of the song goes like this. God is great. Beer is good. And people are crazy. Now... Not all of us might agree with that middle part of the chorus, but I think we can agree with the bookends of that chorus. Because if there is a God, He is great. Can you agree with that? 
If there is a God, He is great. Actually, the last five psalms just heap up this praise to God. Psalm 147.5, it just starts, great is the Lord. The last four psalms, they just say praise the Lord. That's the way they start off. Praise the Lord. Why would you praise Him? Because He is great. Think about this. If there is a God, and I'm, I'm leaving room open there for our skeptics in the audience. If there is a God... You have to conclude that He is great. If He is part of creation, if He has set everything in being, if He has set everything in motion, if we're just, if we're just going to create God like that, if we're going to paint a picture of God like that, He is great. But our God in Christianity is the idea that God sent His only Son, His only Son for us, though we were separated and removed. God is great. And yet, for me, on the other side of the spectrum, you have... People. And people? People are crazy. Now, some of you, I don't need to convince you of this. I mean, like, I say people are crazy, you say amen, preacher. Like, you just did it. You're thinking to yourself, yeah, people are nuts. Preach all day long. People are crazy. People are nuts. But for some of you, you might find yourself a little skeptical. And so I'm going to ask you, if you find yourself a little skeptical about that, go home this week and watch the evening news and count how many times you just end up shaking your head thinking people are crazy. <laughs> people are nuts. Look around this world today and I just can't help to think, man, like people are nuts. People are crazy. What in the world are people thinking? Maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate. People add drama, people add chaos, people add to my stress level. Have you ever found yourself not wanting to go somewhere because of people? <sighs> Hitting a little home, right? <laughs> I just, I don't want to go there because the people are nuts. Maybe for you it's work. You don't want to go to work because the people are crazy. The people are nuts. Your boss is nuts. The customers, they're, they're nuts. You have to deal with these crazy customers all day long. And if you deal with people, you know that they are crazy. People are crazy. You're sitting there and you're thinking, I can never please these people. Dealing with your coworkers, you have the guy that wants to get paid but doesn't want to work. You have the guy that never seems to be happy and he brings the whole office down. You guys know these people. You work with these people. You, you have the lady who always makes her job so difficult, but her job really isn't that difficult. You have the girl that's always gossiping or the guy that's always gossiping, and then you're left wondering, like, is he talking about me? Is she talking about me? People are crazy, but maybe for you, the craziness that is people, it's a little closer to home because the crazy people are in your home. <laughs> you know... I, I love this. Uh, in the original Alice in Wonderland, uh, there's a conversation that goes on between Alice and the Cheshire Cat. And she goes on to say, she's like, I don't want to go among crazy people. And he looks at her and he says, oh, you can't help that. We're all crazy here. <laughs> I think I've, I've said that. I don't want to go among crazy people, but how do you avoid them when they're in your home? Like you keep on trying to run to get away, but they keep on showing back up in your home. The crazy bug has bit and it is infecting your whole household. All you want is a mini vacation and so you find yourself retreating to Starbucks. Time out with friends feels like a welcomed oasis. And yet, there is crazy people in your house. I was talking with one young mother and she I mean, she, she felt so, she felt so bad to say this. She says, David, I love, love my child. Little 18-month-old baby boy. She said, I love my child. But he is an 18-hour-a-day whirlwind of crazy. He is, he's just nuts. He is crazy. Maybe some of you are thinking about that in your teenagers. They're crazy. They are a whirlwind of crazy you find yourself each day asking, what in the world are you thinking? What were you thinking? <laughs> For some of you, it's, it's not your teenage kids, it's your adult kids. We live in a day and age where more adult children are living at home with their parents. And some of you are sitting there thinking, are you crazy? 
Why are you still in my house? Get out of my house. What in the world is wrong with you? Get out of my house. Are you crazy? Are you nuts? Get out of here. But it's not just parents to kids. Some of you are looking at your parents and you're thinking, you guys are nuts. (laughs) You guys are nuts. The drama that is mom and dad's relationship, the chaos of siblings, you think to yourself, man, all I want to do is get away with my friends because these people are crazy. These people are nuts. One man was talking to me about his wife. And he said, she is, she's just crazy. She is crazy. Certified crazy. I love her, but she's driving me absolutely up the wall. He says, I don't, I don't want to deal with this craziness. I don't want to go among crazy people. Do any of us really want to go among crazy people? I told him, I said, quoting the Cheshire cat, oh, you can't help that. See, here's something that we all need to catch. We're all crazy here. We are a community of crazy. I don't know how often I have talked with people. And when it comes to church, the thing that has driven them away from the church or the thing has made them really question, like, I don't want to come to church. I don't even want to be here. Are the crazy people that are here. And yet, we forget. We're all crazy here. And yet in our temporary memory loss, the question becomes, why would we even come? I have a lot of my friends asking the question, why even come to church? A lot of my generation, uh, the millennial generation, they're like, you know what? I don't need the church. I don't need to assemble. I don't need to be here. It's a whole bunch of crazy. I got crazy. I got enough crazy people in my life. Why would I go to church? I got enough drama in my life. Why would I go to church? I got enough people in my business. Why would I come into a community that is identifying itself with accountability. People are crazy. Why should we gather? This is an important question. Because the earliest believers, their practice was gathering consistently, constantly gathering. So in Acts chapter 2, The disciples are gathered together and they are worshiping, they're praying. And I want to pick up in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Just to provide some context, it is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a Jewish holiday. Thousands upon thousands of Jews would have made their way into Jerusalem. They would have come to celebrate God providing. That's the original idea of this holiday. God has provided in the harvest. He has been faithful. He has given us something. And so we gather together. And in the midst of these thousands of people, some estimate hundreds, in the hundred thousands of people, that this little group of people have gathered and and they're together. And then it says this, starting in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, Are not these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others 
mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And so you have this event that takes place. The Holy Spirit descends on these people and they start speaking. And as they're speaking, people, thousands of people, hear the Word of God, declarations of God's greatness in their native tongue. Now, I want to offer a footnote here. In the midst of all these people, this very miraculous event, a number of people are doing what's natural. They're asking questions. When something miraculous is taking place, it's understandable to ask a question. What in the world is going on? But notice, there are some people who mock. There are some people who even in the midst of something that looks divine, something that is clearly divine, that just dismiss it away. They find a way of explaining it away, no matter what it is. Anyways, in the midst of this mocking, Peter takes the opportunity and he he starts to speak. And he speaks the great oracles of God. He tells them about this Jesus Christ, the King who has been crucified, the one whom they crucified. And so we come to the text that was read for us. They find themselves cut to the heart. Thousands of people come to faith. 3,000. They respond to the invitation. Peter offers an invitation and they say, I want a part of that. I want to be part of that. I I want to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they do. 3,000 are baptized. And then in verse 42, going on down to verse 47 we find a portion of text that is extremely popular in the church. The fellowship of the believers. It's a portion of text that tells us the the practices of these ancient Christians, these Christians that go on long before us. And what we find is that these believers were committed to a number of things. But one of the things they were committed to was gathering together. The question is, why were they gathering together? And the secret, I believe, is in verse 44, Acts chapter 2, verse 44. I want us to focus in on one portion of one verse this morning, just one portion of one verse this morning. Here's what the text says. Pay attention. And all who believed were together. And all who believed were together. Yes, ancient Christians had a practice of gathering together. They would meet together. Down in verse 46, we find that they met in the temple and they met in each other's homes. Ancient Christians were a group of people that were committed to large group gatherings and they were a group of people that were committed to smaller groups group gatherings. They were committed to assembling as a whole and they were committed to these smaller groups where they could be a little more intimate in conversation. This is what they were committed to. But why were they committed to that? I would suggest to you today they were committed to it because they were together. They were together. Not only did they meet together, they were together. The essence of who they are is now in us. There's a sociological thing that happens when we gather in groups. There's a factor when we think of ourselves as an individual looking in the amongst a group, and there's a point when we just become one of the crowd. We're one amongst many. And so the way we think fundamentally, fundamentally, is about us. It's us. It's not me. And notice, notice, they were together. Not only did they meet together, they were together. I think about 
In 1140 AD, King Conrad, I've told this story a number of years ago, King Conrad uh, was making his way, conquering different territories, and he came upon a city named Weinsberg. And in Weinsberg, they would try to send out some people, some ambassadors to plead on their behalf because King Conrad had a habit of going in and just destroying things. He would completely lay waste to the whole city. But he just dismissed the ambassador. He said he didn't want to talk to them. Some ladies of the city came. And they pleaded on behalf of the city. And he said, I will let you leave. But only with what you can carry on your back. The next day, the women of Weinsberg left their city that they loved. Carrying their most prized possessions. The women of that city left carrying their fathers, their husbands, and their children on their backs. And a great number of the city was saved because they had a concept of we're in this together. We're in this together. We are here together. We are about this business together. We are together. We meet together because we are together. This is the revelation. But I want us to notice why they were together. What's the reason that they identify together? It actually precedes it. And all who believed. See, here's the reality that we we need to catch. When ancient believers gathered together, you need to understand it was just as crazy for them as it is for us. And sometimes we get like this perfect picture of ancient Christians like they weren't flawed people. These were deeply flawed people. Sociologists, when they look at this portion of text, they talk about this as like a mixed bag of nuts. I mean, these are cra- I mean, these are different people, different backgrounds. If you look at the people that have responded to Peter's message, these are different people, different backgrounds, different family habits, and yet they all are committed to being together. Why? Because of the gospel. And all who believed were together. See, when they put their faith in the gospel, when they said, hey, you know what, this isn't about us, this is about him, they gathered together. This is huge for us. Because if we're thinking about us, if we're saying, hey, you know what, I don't want to deal with these people, there's all kinds of crazy people here, you know what, we won't show up. We will not show up. We'll start to remove ourselves from because we don't want to deal with the craziness. No one wants to deal with the craziness. And it's understandable. Guys, people bring drama. People add to my stress level. People are crazy. And so when you gather a group of people together, what's there going to be? There's going to be craziness. But for these believers, it was not, listen to this, and this is huge, it was not about them gathering just because their backgrounds were together, just because they looked alike, because they were in the same economic class. It's not because they were the same race. I want you to think with me. Um, growing up, there was, there was an idea that if, if you had a certain race or ethic, you found yourself going to certain religious practices. And so if you grew up in the Middle East, there's a good chance, what? What was your religious practice? Muslim. Okay. I got my Daruza family here. If you're Italian or Irish, you're most likely Catholic. There it is. That's, that's the way people think. Just, just from a sociological perspective. But the gospel says that's not the way it works. That is not the way it works. We don't group around the physical things. We group around one thing. And let me tell you the one thing. It is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It is the thing that brings us into this moment. It is the thing that calls us together because we believe in the one who has died and has resurrected. And so we are called into this moment, even in our differences. This morning, we have people gathered here and we gather for one reason. One reason only. It is because Jesus Christ has been crucified and He has been resurrected. And so even in the midst of our craziness, we focus on this one fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I will put up with your craziness. Why? 
Because I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. I am committed to gathering with you. Because why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. This isn't about me. And it's not about you. This is about what we believe. And what we believe is key. It is called good news. It is the thing that compels us into action. And so what? So what? And so we must gather. We must gather. If you are a believer, it is only natural to gather. It is only natural to join into community. Guys, this is huge. Think of it like this. When a baby is born, you don't tell the baby to cry. You never just tell the baby to cry. Why? Because crying is a sign of life. A baby is born and it cries. It is a sign of life. (laughs) Community is a sign of spiritual life. When you don't want to gather together, there is, there is a reality there that you need to take note of. Because all who believed were together. They were together. And they met together. They gathered together. See, the gospel compels us into these relationships where, you know what, I might struggle to deal with you, but I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to put up with you. I'm going to bear with you. Why? Because it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about him. So now what? So what? Now what? Now we give ourselves over to devotion to the community. We give ourselves over to the devotion of the community. Notice in verse 42... What it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship. The idea of that, of fellowship, is they were gathering together. Notice in verse 46, how often were they gathering together? They were gathering together daily. Now, your preacher is not going to tell you that you need to gather with everyone here every single day of this next week. I am not going to say that. What I am going to say is this, we must be about the practice of gathering. I want you to notice this about early believers They were just as crazy and they were just as busy as we are. They had responsibilities. They had responsibilities. They had work that they had to give themselves over to. Most most church historians would say this. Early Christians, you know when they met? Early, early in the morning. Before work. Because Sunday wasn't a holy day then. That's not much anymore, is it? And so they would gather early in the morning to celebrate over what the Lord had done. They would gather together and encourage one another. Here's here's what I want you to commit yourself to. I know we have some visitors today. And if you want to give yourself over to this, that would be fantastic. That would be great. But I want to speak to those of you who are, are believers. Those of you guys who are committed and you're saying, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm part of this body. I'm part of the larger body. I'm committed to the church. I'm committed to the church. I'm committed to her Savior. I'm committed to her King. I want you to give yourself over to coming every Sunday morning for the next month. Every Sunday morning for the next month. And if it's not here, if it's not here, gather. Gather. Because you know right about now there's a church off of 44, the Louisville Church of Christ. We're not physically with them, but we're with them. We gather together. We're committed to this. Here's the second thing. So you have a larger group. I want you to commit to a gathering of the larger group for the next four weeks. Here's the second thing I want you to practice. This is the second thing I want you to put and implement into your life. I want you to have someone over at your house. I want you to have someone over at your house. There is something special. I'll tell you what, I want to come back to my Darusa illustration. Uh, I love this family. This family has been precious to me. And, and you know what? They would let me come over to their house anytime. Miss, Mama Darusa, Mama Darusa, she would welcome me in at any point. And there was something sacred about being over at the Darusa house. Actually, there's something about being in someone's house that's, that's really powerful. 
When someone sits down at a table and creates a meal for you, is that not an intimate moment? When they let you into their house and it's just you and them, your family and them, I want you to commit to the next four Sundays. And this next week, this next week, if you can't do it this week, if life is super packed, I want you to try to do it the following week. I want you to have someone in your house and, and enjoy their presence. Enjoy being with them. Enjoy what the good news does practically for us day in, day out. Celebrate over each other's families. Guys, I want you to imagine with me, if you will, a church that gathers together and loves it. Even in the midst of the craziness. Guys, I get it. I get it. What do we say? God is great. People are... What? Crazy. God is great. People are crazy. I get that. If anyone gets that, I get that. (laughs) And yet, even in the midst of some of the crazy moments and some of the crazy things that are brought to my attention, I love you. And I want to be with you. Because why? Because it's really about Him. It's really about Him. Us gathering together, it shapes the way we deal with each other. It shapes the way we work with each other. Imagine a church that is gathering together. Imagine a church that is seeking to be in each other's lives. Imagine a church that offers accountability to one another. Now imagine a church where we are just getting a sense of each other's needs. And we know each other in a relational sense that, hey, you know what, if I see that you need something, if I'm getting a sense that emotionally you need something, I'm about trying to serve you. Because we are together in this. Because He has brought us together in this. There is no other way but community. Jim Van Yipperen is a church consultant. And he says this, You cannot have Christianity without the church. You cannot have Christianity without the church. It is impossible. Because why? Because the gospel brings us together. It calls us to deal with each other. Even in those moments when we're looking in each other's eyes and we're thinking, man, you are so crazy. May we be about his business.